So we are in the middle of a mini-series in the Psalms. We're looking at uh, six Psalms in five weeks. So the first week we looked at Psalms 1 and 2, and then last week Psalm 32, and this morning we're going to look at Psalm 34. All right? So you're welcome to turn there. We are going to look at something else before we get there, so you can just keep your finger in Psalm 34. Um, But let me just, you know, little refresher here. Why are we focusing on this um, this group of psalms and under the heading of how blessed? Um, why are we focused on getting blessings? You know, we should be focused on doing what's right, right? And if we're blessed, then so be it. But if we're not, then we've done what's right anyway, right? Well, the Bible reveals a world in which God created everything good, good, very good. The curse entered the world when we turned from him, doubting his goodness, and pursued what we believed would be good. What we thought would be the better, the blessed path. So the issue is, who are we going to trust? Who knows what's best for us, what is good for us, okay? So we're actually hardwired to go after the blessing. There's no avoiding that, just as human beings. The only question is, where are we going to go to get it? And again, because of sin, because of our fallen nature, we are prone to wander and look for it in all the wrong places. So we need to learn, we need God to teach us the blessed path. Okay, so that's what this series is focused on, helping us to look in the right places, to hear from the one who knows us best, who made us. He knows what's best for us. To be attuned to his voice, to trust him and follow him. So Psalm 1, blessed is the man whose delight is in Yahweh's teaching. And on that teaching, he meditates day and night. He will be like a stable, fruitful, durable tree. Look at how blessed. He's not going to be like chaff. If you take your cues from the world and you're shaped by the values of this world, what the world says is the blessed, good life, you'll actually be like chaff. Psalm 2, blessed is the one who takes refuge in King Jesus. So he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. If you reject his rule, you will be cursed. But instead, if you recognize your need and you hear that amnesty is offered to all who lay down their arms against him and submit to him, repenting of their rebellion, trusting in him as savior, blessed is everyone who takes refuge in King Jesus. And then Psalm 32, echoing that same theme, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the one against whom Yahweh counts no iniquity, justification, justified before God, reconciled to God by the blood of Jesus. Blessed is the man in whose spirit there is no deceit. The person who's gotten real with God honest with him or herself, honest with God, recognizing, again, need and transgression and iniquity and sin, and we can't atone for our own sins, so the only hope is to run to Jesus. And when you run to Jesus, your sins are totally forgiven, totally covered. We can't atone for our sins, but he can atone for our sins. How blessed to be forgiven and free and cleansed and covered and reconciled. So, all these blessings are ours. So we ought to pursue this blessedness. How blessed? Hey, teach me the path. Show me. I want it. That's what this series is all about. We need to learn this. You know, Jesus came on the scene and Sermon on the Mount, what did he say? Here's the king bringing his kingdom on the scene. What did he say? Blessed is the man right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. 
So oftentimes, this is like totally countercultural from the value system of the world. True blessing is usually countercultural, and oftentimes, well, always it goes against the grain of our sinful nature, right? And certainly the lies and deceit of the devil. So we need to learn, we need to listen, attune our, our ears to the voice of God, what he says, and trust him. He knows where blessing is to be found. So Psalm 34 this morning, you know, we don't always have like the background situation spelled out in the Psalms. Last week, Psalm 32, there's no heading. Um, so we're not sure if it was the Bathsheba incident, you know, David's terrible guilt there that he's speaking of and it's in response when he finally repented and came to his senses um, through the ministry of, of Nathan the prophet or if it was some other situation because certainly David um, committed his fair share of sin sins. So the generality of a psalm like Psalm 32 with no specific heading can be really helpful because it's broadly applicable, Right? It's relatable to all kinds of people in all kinds of situations. But sometimes the lack of specificity and background kind of frustrates us, right? Like, so what was going on? What, why did he write this song? We wish we knew the background as an aid to our understanding and application. Well, here you go, Psalm 34. So if you're there, do you see the heading? We'll look at it in a minute. It's very specific. Same heading, re related heading to Psalm 56 that Al read a few minutes ago. So here's this situation. It's a unique situation. Not a situation we're going to find ourselves in. You know, I doubt many of us will have to flee from some murderous, jealous king who wants to pin us to the wall with a spear and only to flee right into the hands of the enemy that we've previously conquered more than once in battle. Does that fit anybody's situation? No. But that doesn't mean that Psalm 34 isn't applicable to us. It means that the historical situation needs to be taken into account to understand the psalm and to know how to apply it. So look at that heading over Psalm 34. It's of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. What? What in the world is that referring to? Well, let's find out. We can find out. 1 Samuel 21. Okay, so as you turn there, let me just catch you up to speed. What's going on in 1 Samuel? Remember, 1 Samuel 17 is David and Goliath, you know? Like anybody who's ever read a children's Bible knows that story. So David, teenager probably at the time, strikes down Goliath, the Philistine champion. And when they returned home from routing the Philistines, the women sang... Saul, the king at the time, has struck his thousands. David, his tens of thousands. <laughs> so you can imagine how enjoyable that was to Saul, the king, to hear that song. It angered Saul. He was jealous of David and he wanted him dead. So he literally tries to pin him to the wall with a spear twice. But because of Saul's distrust, disobedience, the Lord was no longer with Saul. And the Lord was now with David. So Saul actually feared David and wanted to get rid of him. He tried a variety of schemes to get rid of him. They all failed. One of the ways um, Saul's plans became known and, and were foiled a couple times was through Jonathan, his own son, Saul's own son. Because Jonathan loved David like a brother and defended him rather than siding with his father's murderous intent. Okay, so he warned David a couple times and David fled. So here, right before 1 Samuel 21, Jonathan has warned David. David flees and as he fled, he stopped in a place called Nob and spoke to Abimelech, the priest. He was looking for provisions and a weapon because he was without both. And Himelech gave him the holy bread, and then look at verse 8 of 1 Samuel 21, this background story, okay? It's on page 244 if you're using the Pew Bible. Verse 8, then David said to Himelech, 
Then have you not here a spear or a sword at hand? For I've brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste. That's the story he's telling, the king's business. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath a Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, behold, it's here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it. For there's none but, there is none but that here. And David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. What? <laughs> Goliath of Gath, okay? And the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck his thousands and David his ten thousands? And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see, this man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? <laughs> Crazy situation, crazy story, but that's the background of Psalm 34, okay? So if you picked up on it, it says Akish in 1 Samuel 21. At the heading of Psalm 34, it's Abimelech. Wait, are these different situations? Well, almost certainly not. So Abimelech means my father is king. So most likely, that was a Philistine throne name, and his personal name was Akish, okay? So like in Egypt, you had pharaohs, lots of pharaohs. Throne title, pharaoh. Name, Ramses II, or Tutkahamen, or whatever. Get it? Everybody tracking? Okay. So what in the world possessed David, Philistine conqueror, you know, killed Goliath, their champion, to flee to the Philistines for refuge. Okay, here's the scholarly consensus. Ready? I have no idea. Like, I don't think we totally know. Must have been pretty desperate. I mean, certainly they didn't have like, you know, Instagram or Google images back then. So maybe he thought, they won't recognize me. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but he must have been pretty desperate. Certainly he was if you read Psalm 34 and read his description of his experience. Okay, so let's start with that. Verses four to seven, we're gonna start with verses four to seven and then come back up to the beginning of Psalm 34. So look at verse four to seven. Point number one, desperation and deliverance. David writes, I sought Yahweh and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. It's a strong word for fear there. It's translated terrors in other places like Psalm 31. So I sought Yahweh and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. It's quite a contrast to his feigned madness in Gath, this poor man cried and Yahweh heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of Yahweh encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. So again, read these words in light of the background we just looked at. 1 Samuel 21. So 1 Samuel 21 tells the story in kind of a newspaper sort of way of what happened or a, or a novel sort of way. Psalm 34 gives a window into what was going on inside David's mind and heart. He was desperate, that's obvious. But he didn't just cleverly figure his way out of a jam. He sought Yahweh. This poor man cried to Yahweh and he heard and saved him. So he doesn't say, wasn't that lucky? <laughs> Can't believe that worked. Or, wasn't that clever of me? 
No, he says, God rescued me. So Alec Motier, um, late British Old Testament scholar, he offers a helpful take on what could have happened. Again, did this happen exactly this way? We don't know, but this is, I think, helpful thoughts. Um, And by the way, what we're going to start doing, and it should be present tomorrow, Lord willing, um, is put all the quotes, so the PDF that goes on the sermon page, um, the notes for each, it's basically just the outline. On Monday, we're going to put all the quotes in, okay? So that, because sometimes people take pictures or you're trying to like write down something. So on Mondays, that PDF is going to be replaced with one that has the quotes. So you should be able to access, if you ever like a quote and want to refer back to it, you can find it that way on the website. So no need to um, furiously write down something if you appreciate a quote. All right, so Alec Motier writes this, one does not need much imagination to think what a good story David would have made of his pretended loopiness and how he fooled his way out of danger in Gath. So think of him recounting his cleverness cleverness yet once more when suddenly it came over him that in fact there was a real story hidden inside the good story. A real story of prayer made and prayer answered. Yes, he had played the madman, but he had also prayed. And wasn't that the real story? Wasn't that what he ought to be telling his friends? Not boosting his own cleverness, but boasting and rejoicing confidently in his saving, delivering God. Did he suddenly stop telling the tale and say, please excuse me, and slip off to some solitary place where he could write what we call Psalm 34? The story within the story is the one to listen to. So Psalm 34 recounts the story inside the story of 1 Samuel 21, and it is written for our learning in Psalm 34. So this poor man cried. The Lord delivered him. Those who look to him are radiant. Those who look to Yahweh are radiant. Their faces shall never be ashamed, even if they play the fool at times. And was he saved because of this or in spite of this? (laughs) We don't know, but bottom line, God saved him. God delivered him. Our desperation is a setup for God's deliverance. And God's deliverance means his glory and our good. So we've sung the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. We've sung it many times over the years. Look at these words and look at how this actually is a common dynamic in our lives. It ought to be more common. But when we experience the deliverance of the Lord, especially in the midst of our desperation, we can't help but boast in that deliverance. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. We're desperate without him. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. So I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. So when we sing this song, and others like it, we're boasting in the Lord. This is not a proud boasting. It's a humble boasting. This is like Paul in Galatians 6, 14. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So when you know your desperateness, like we can't deal with our sins, we can't atone for them, can't make up for them. 
And then you know the sweetness of Jesus' work in your place on the cross, taking care of all your sin, desperation, and deliverance. You boast in the cross. 1 Corinthians 1, same idea. And Paul is reminding the church in Corinth. It's important to remember where you came from. Remember your desperation. For consider your calling, brothers. Like, don't forget. (laughs) You know, sometimes we can kind of, we can grow and mature and maybe we lose sight of how desperate we are. And we can start to get self-righteous and that's not good. So for con- consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God of his or her own accomplishments And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. It's all of grace. Who became to us wisdom from God, the righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So no human being should boast in the presence of God unless we're boasting in the Lord. He gets the glory. We get the good. We get the blessing. We get the help. So there is a kind of boasting that's humble and David is doing it in Psalm 34. So verses four to seven, Psalm 34, recount David's experience of desperation and deliverance and as a result, he blesses Yahweh and he invites us to do the same thing. So point number two, magnify Yahweh with me. Verses one to three. I will bless Yahweh at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in Yahweh. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify Yahweh with me and let us exalt his name together. Let me just stop for a second um, because I've said this a number of times, but you know, some folks could be newer. Why do I keep reading Yahweh? Why did Al read Yahweh? It says Lord. Like, can't you guys read? Um, Might even get annoying. Is anybody getting annoyed with Yahweh, 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 Yahweh? Um, Let me just explain again why we read it that way. So look at Psalm 8.1, just as a for instance. Can you throw that slide up? Did I give you that slide? (laughs) I did not. There we go. I didn't give something last week where I was like, hey, is that slide? That was my fault last week, not their fault. And here we go. So Psalm 8.1, you can turn there. Um... says this, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O Lord, all the letters are capital, our Lord, they're not capitalized. What's going on? Well, O Lord, all four letters capitalized, speaking of the divine covenant name Yahweh, our Lord, master, king, title, right? So, here, here's, here's the point. Out of reverence for the name of God, Jewish custom took the covenantal name of God, Yahweh, and said, Lord, okay? And we've kind of kept that. But the problem is it's misleading because Lord is a title, not a name, right? So Beth is my wife. Beth is her name. Wife is title, Okay? And, you know, in certain contexts, you know, it's appropriate, appropriate for me to use her title and in other contexts to use her name. If I always referred to her by her title, it would get really annoying. You know, like if, you, if I introduce you to her, this is my wife, that's normal. But if I'm constantly, especially at home, like saying, hey, wife. <laughs> like, okay, you get the idea. God has granted us the privilege and the intimacy of calling him by name. Lord is what he is. Yahweh is who he is. So, O Yahweh, our Lord, Psalm 8. Or, here, 
I will bless Yahweh. Yes, he is our Lord. He's our master. He's our king. He's all kinds of things. But this is personal relationship that's being spoken of here. Sorry, that took a lot longer than I anticipated. It's all my fault. So hope that makes sense. Back to verse one. So David has experienced desperation and deliverance, right? The undeserved blessing of Yahweh. And so he's blessing Yahweh. He's praising him. And then he invites us to join him. So personal worship, after you've experienced the blessing of God, oftentimes leads to communal worship. It's good and right to rejoice with those who rejoice. Have you ever heard a testimony of God's grace and blessing and deliverance and help in somebody else and they share that and they're just bubbling over with joy at God's kindness and mercy in their lives and it just makes you praise God. Of course, like this happens in community discussions when, you know, somebody shares what God's done in their life and we're all like, yes, you know, praise God from whom all blessings flow or a baptism and somebody shares their testimony of how they went from, you know, rebellion to becoming a beloved child or, of God and they're like, yes, I'm so thankful for God's grace in my life and everybody's like, woo, all right. Blessing experienced leads to blessing expressed leads to more people blessing. Blessing leads to blessing leads to blessing. Everybody tracking with that? Did you have enough coffee this morning? Let's track. Paul does this in Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So he's blessing God first in this verse, but what came first? The blessing to Paul and to the Ephesian church. When they experienced the blessing, then the blessing of praise is the reflex, right? Blessing leads to blessing. Peter does the same thing. 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Look at all this blessing that's ours. Bless the Lord. So blessing, experiencing the blessing, leads us to bless God and leads us to invite others encourage others to join in the praise. It's quite the opposite of the vicious cycle of grumbling and misery, <laughs> which kind of like drags everybody else down, right? This is the virtuous cycle of grace and praise, grace and blessing. So those of us who've been desperate and have experienced deliverance, we will boast, we will magnify the Lord, we will Praise the Lord. Bless his name. And it's a humble boast. It's not a boast in our cleverness or power, but in God's mercy and grace and power. So I'm magnifying the name of Yahweh. Join me. Look at all he's done. Isn't he great? So I've, I've quoted from this before in past years, but it just captures this dynamic so profoundly. Uh, remember the first time in seminary that I ran across these thoughts and it just literally, it's like paradigm shift and changed my life. Um, so C.S. Lewis has this little essay called A Word About Praising in Reflections on the Psalms. And this longer quote is not up there. It'll be on the sheet tomorrow, okay? But see if you can track and follow along. He, he, he admits, you know, he wasn't um, a Christian when he was teaching at, is it Oxford or Cambridge? I can't remember at first. But he says this, when I first began to draw near to belief in God and even for some time after it, it had been given to me, I found a stumbling block in the demand so clamorously made by all religious people that we should praise God. Still more in the suggestion that God himself demanded it. Like, why is he telling people to praise him. 
We all despise the man who demands continued assurance of his own virtue, intelligence, or delightfulness. We despise still more the crowd of people around every dictator, every millionaire, every celebrity who gratify that demand. Thus a picture at once ludicrous and horrible both of God and of his worshipers threatened to appear in my mind. The Psalms were especially troublesome in this way. Praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord with me. Praise him. And why, incidentally, did praising God so often consist in telling other people to praise him? It was extremely distressing. The miserable idea that God should in any sense need or crave for our worship to him was like a vain woman seeking compliments, like fishing for compliments. But then he says this, but the most obvious fact about praise, whether of God or anything else, strangely escaped me. I've never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. The world rings with praise. Lovers praising their mistresses, readers their favorite poet, walkers praising the countryside, players praising their favorite game, sports. Praise of weather, wines, dishes, actors, motors, horse, I think that'd probably be like cars, horses, colleges, countries, historical personages, children, flowers, mountains, rare stamps, rare beetles. Anybody? Probably not. Even sometimes politicians or scholars. I had not noticed how the humblest and at the same time most balanced and capacious praised most, while the cranks, misfits, and malcontents praised least. Praise almost seems to be inner health made audible. I had not noticed either that just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, so they spontaneously urge others to join them in praising it. Isn't she lovely? Wasn't it glorious? The psalmist in telling everyone to praise God are doing what all men do when they speak of what they care about. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. The delight is incomplete till it is expressed. When you really enjoy something, don't you just want to share it with somebody? And especially if they enjoy it too, it doubles your pleasure. So he finishes this section here with the Westminster Catechism, says that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But we shall then know that these are the same thing. Fully to enjoy is to glorify. In commanding us to glorify him, praise him, God is inviting us to enjoy him. Oh, magnify Yahweh with me and let us exalt his name together. Experience his benefits. Taste and see that the Lord is good. That's where he goes next, right? And you will be delighted and that delight will express itself in praise. So blessing leads to blessing, leads to blessing. When we experience the blessing of Yahweh, we can't help expressing it and encouraging others to join us. That is, it happens in the church as encouragement. It happens outside the church as evangelism. <laughs> like, if you're flat, cold, just to connect some dots here, if you've got no joy in Jesus, how often do you share your faith? Not that often. If you are just like rejoicing in the Lord and you have an opportunity to share the good news, you are way more prone to open your mouth, right? So, oh, magnify Yahweh with me and let us exalt his name together. So if that's gonna happen, we must first experience the blessing of Yahweh. So point number three, taste and fear. Verses eight to 10. Oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. So in light of David's experience, the blessing of protection and deliverance that he experienced, he encourages us to taste and see, to experience, to join him in knowing the blessing that he's known. So again, here I'm just gonna beat this dead horse. <laughs> Why are we doing this series on how to be blessed? Because we all fall prey to the oldest lie in the book. To 
did God really say? Like, maximize the restriction, minimize the freedom. Wait, you can eat of any of the trees, just not this one. And all of a sudden, this glorious garden became a prison. That God is not good, that he doesn't have your good in mind, that he's holding out on you, that he's a killjoy. No, we need to taste and see and believe that he's good, he does good, and he has our good in mind. He wants what's best for us. He's not aiming at leftovers for us. Taste and see. A feast is what he wants to give us. A feast of his grace and his mercy and his glory and his blessings. If we want blessing, it's only ultimately found in God, on the path of trusting and obeying him. Taste and see how good God is. Experience how blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Take refuge in him. Don't run elsewhere. Like that's the temptation, right? Whenever we're desperate. When in our desperation. So the application, certainly we can taste right now a little bit of God's glory, but the application is gonna be your desperation this week. Where are you gonna run? That's when you're going to need to taste and see how good God is. Don't run as elsewhere. When we self-medicate instead of running to Jesus, we starve our souls of the blessing of his grace and his love. What happens is we fear people, we fear circumstances, threats, and we can run to our own coping mechanisms, our survival techniques, and you know, some of them are neutral, but like when we forget God and try to substitute other things for refuge and help and strength and comfort, we're actually starving our souls of the good that God wishes to give us. He becomes small and the threats loom large and so David is wisely teaching us where to turn. Don't let God get small and these threats get big. Verse nine, fear Yahweh. Reverence him. He's really, really, really big. Respect, reverence him, you his saints. For those who fear him, don't cower in the corner in abject terror. No, they have no lack. It's either the threats that are going to be big or God's going to be big. Fear him, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek Yahweh, fearing Yahweh, seeking Yahweh, are related, lack no good thing. So may he loom large. Lord, answer that prayer this week that you would be big and other people, threats, circumstantial challenges, our desperation, those things would shrink in the light of your greatness. Fear Yahweh. When he is the one we're centered on, the one to whom we run for refuge, we will lack nothing that we need, what we most desperately need. We will have no lack. It's like Psalm 23. Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not want. That doesn't mean there's not going to be any challenges because he might lead you right through the valley of the shadow of death but he'll be with you. You don't have to fear. He'll be with you. He'll give you what you need. So of all the beasts, young lions, lions in their prime, they're going to get fed, right? They're going to get what they need. It's an image, it's a metaphor. Putin and his oligarchs can seem to win and poor Russian Christians or Ukrainian Christians, so many others suffer. But what's really true is that the strong, self-sufficient predators of this world are the ones who will ultimately go hungry. And it's the needy, humble ones who look to Jesus who will ultimately lack no good thing. It's what Isaiah says in Isaiah 40. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord, Yahweh, is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. 
And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary. And young men think the ancient Near Eastern equivalent of Navy SEALs shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for Yahweh will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So young lions, you know, the, the strongest will suffer want and hunger. But those who seek Yahweh will lack no good thing. So why does David use this language of tasting here in verse 8? I asked Ben this last night before he went to bed. Why do, why do you think that language is used? Isn't it all about finding out by experience? You've got you've to taste for yourself. You've got to see for yourself. So David is pleading with us, he, lovingly, he's, take refuge in him. Taste his goodness. See how good he is in the midst of your desperation. You can see God's goodness in my story. I mean, I was like out of my mind, like kind of sort of literally almost. But don't just take my word for it. Experience his goodness for yourself. Pursue him in your story. So you, can, you and I, we can know there's food in the fridge, but it doesn't do us any good unless we get off the couch, go open the fridge, take the food out, stick it in our mouths and taste it. We can know cognitively, intellectually, that God is good, but we've got to taste and see that he's good, especially in the midst of dif difficulty and desperation. If we taste that Yahweh is good, his praise will be on our tongue, in our mouth. So again, if you taste something that's tasty, what do you do? Mmm. Mmm, this is good. Hey, Beryl, you got to try this. See, it's what, it's what David is doing. So how many of you know that old movie, What About Bob? <laughs> Nobody does. Okay, okay. Thank you for the participation. Um, so you can just like Google this. What about Bob dinner scene? Okay, copyright and all. We won't put it up. Okay. So Richard Dreyfus, Bill Murray. So Dreyfus is this psychotherapist. You know, successful, whatever. He he loses his mind. <laughs> That's part of the humor of the whole thing. After one of his most dependent patients, who's played by Bill Murray is this obsessive compulsive neurotic, tracks him down on family vacation, okay? And the family kind of welcomes, you know, Bob Wiley, Bob Bill Murray, in to the vacation home. Dr. Leo Marvin is like, yeah, you know, like going crazy. Well, there's a scene at the dinner where Bob has been invited to dinner, not by Dr. Marvin, but by his wife and kids, and Bob can't stop expressing his delight in the meal. And it, it gets a little awkward, but that's part of the humor of it. It drives the psychotherapist nuts but he's just like mm, mm, you know it's just taste and see that the, Yahweh is good is that a little too abrupt okay you, you get it it's just a picture of if we if we if we taste if we experience how good he is we it's going to be expressed and we're going to start saying to each other I need this. I need this coming in on Sunday morning. I need these people up here like helping me get my heart out of the like, <laughs> I didn't prepare this metaphor. Um, I don't know. It's cold. I need my heart to wake up and be warmed. And they're leading me in worship. And I'm like, yes, that's right. That's true. <sighs> they're, they're saying, magnify the Lord with me. Let, me. let me just remind you some of Josh's, you know, thoughtful words he prepared. Christ is mine forevermore. I'm his forevermore. Nothing can separate me. Like, that's really good for us to be reminded of the gospel. And then we praise together. So, we can know that honey's sweet, but if we don't taste it, our knowledge is pathetic. It's not real knowledge, right? We can't be satisfied merely with intellectual ideas of God. 
We need to experience his goodness and his grace. It's the prayer of Ephesians 3. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father that according to the riches of his glory he may grant to you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. How do you know something that surpasses knowledge? Only by experience. Like, don't you want to experience the goodness of God? Lord, answer. Like, make this psalm our experience. How blessed is the one who takes refuge in Yahweh. The whole psalm, in a sense, unpacks that from a variety of different angles. So we're not really going to look much at the end of the psalm. I encourage you to just take a look at it on your own. But just see the flow of thought here. Verses 8 and 9 are parallel. Taste and see that Yahweh is good. Blessed is the man. Fear Yahweh. Those who fear him have no lack. Two ways of saying the same thing. Okay? Tasting and seeing, fearing, and then the benefits. But all this talk of fearing the Lord, would you teach me about the fear of the Lord? Because if that's the source of all this blessing, like, I, I need to know what this is. Well, come, children, pupils, students, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Of Yahweh. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Who doesn't want good? We all do. So keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So again, we're not going to take all the time that would be necessary to kind of expound the rest of this psalm, but just know that how do we pursue the good life? Ultimately, we can only find it in, in God, through Christ. But good comes from trusting God and his path of obedience, his path of blessing, trusting him. He's the one that knows what's best, so we're going to follow him, not striking out on our own as if we know better what's in our best interest, what's good for us. So obedience to God's command is essential to the good life. So fish are happier in water, doing what they're created to do, not rebelling against their nature and their purpose. It's not freedom to be flopping about on the shore or in the boat. If a fish throws off that restriction, it suffocates and dies. So freedom isn't the absence of commands or restrictions. It's submitting to the right ones. And God's the one who knows the right ones for us. And so he's the one saying, listen, let me teach you how to walk. And then you have this language in 15 to the end. The eyes of Yahweh toward the righteous, his ears toward their cry. He's against those who do evil. When the righteous cry for help, he hears and delivers them. He's near to the brokenhearted. Isn't that sweet? And saves the crushed in spirit. More blessing to those who take refuge in him. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, but Yahweh delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked. Those who hate the righteous will be condemned. Yahweh redeems the life of his servants. You could misunderstand this to think that there's these promises that what well, seems like he's just going to deliver them from all trouble and they're not going to have any trouble. That would be to misread it. Okay, so let me just close with two quotes and then we've got two songs we're going to sing before we're dismissed. So Peter Craigie first, the fear of the Lord is indeed the foundation of life, the key to joy in life and long and happy days, but it is not a guarantee that life will always be easy, devoid of the difficulties that may seem to mar so much of human experience or human existence. The fear of the Lord establishes joy and fulfillment in all of life experiences. It may mend the broken heart, but it does not prevent the heart from being broken. It may restore the spiritually crushed, but it does not crush the forces that may create oppression. The psalm, if fully grasped, dispels the naivety of that faith which does not contain within it the strength to stand against the onslaught of evil. And then let me close with this. The musicians can come on up. So Kathy Keller, Tim Keller's wife, 
suffered terribly in 2015. And she wrote about it briefly with a meditation on Psalm 34 because Psalm 34 was a psalm the Lord led her to that she memorized and meditated on. And so let me just read her words here and then we'll close and sing. She writes, for the last 11 months, I've known anxiety, fear, emergency plane rides, surgery, more surgery, emergency surgery, more emergency surgery, infection, infections that occurred while on antibiotics from the previous infection, non-healing surgical wounds, more surgery, and not least in my litany of self-pity, twice daily dressing changes for wounds that will not go away. And she's reflecting on the psalm. It sounds as if the psalmist is giving us a blanket promise that God will always deliver us from our troubles, comfort us when we're crushed and brokenhearted, and protect us from harm. But wait. Verse 20, where the psalmist says, he, God, will protect all his bones, not one of them will be broken, is a messianic prophecy. It's quoted in John's gospel account of the crucifixion of Jesus when the soldiers refrained from breaking Jesus' legs to hasten his death because he was already dead. John says in 1936, these things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. My reaction at noticing this was at first bewilderment. Well, yes, none of his bones got broken, but he did get crucified. That kind, that kind of doesn't count as being protected from anything bad in my book. But when it comes to my understanding versus scripture, I know there's always something lacking in my understanding. Jesus' bones weren't broken, but he died a painful, hideous death. God didn't save him from that, but God's protection of Jesus extended past the grave. He was raised from the dead. Follow the thread, Kathy. Follow the thought. While God may not protect you from every bad thing that might, has, or could happen to you, ultimately happen to you, ultimately through resurrection, you are safe. I will walk through death and come out on the other side fully healed, restored, saved, and protected. God does not protect us from things that harm us. He protects us as we go through them to the other side of the resurrection where our real hopes and happiness lie. Now there's a thought I can cling to. Amen.